Well, good morning. Uh, microphone's not working today, so I'll do my best to make sure all of you can hear. Um, and for you that are in the front, I'm sure you'll be able to hear. Uh, I know it's Thursday morning, and uh, I don't have to ask if you're tired. I probably should ask if there anyone is here that isn't tired. Anybody? All right. Oh, yeah! Uh, all right, we need to figure out whatever he's doing and uh, do some of that. But I, I thought this morning, before we uh, dive into the, the book of Galatians, we're going to be in chapter 4 in a, in a few minutes, but I thought we'd start out with a story. And I, I want to share a story that I'm pretty sure all of you have heard. It's a familiar story, but it is a very, very powerful story. And it was told by the master storyteller himself. Any guesses on who that was? Jesus, right? Jesus was an amazing storyteller. And you know, story has a very, very powerful way of, of speaking to us because story engages our minds and our imaginations. Anybody have a good imagination? All right. I'm thankful I have one. Got me through school, right? Daydreaming. But story has a way of, of communicating to us and engaging our, our, our minds and our hearts. And so as we continue to think about the gospel and as we think about, about the grace of God that Paul's writing to us and employing us not, not to turn away from, there's a story that, was found, that Jesus told one day. It's found in Luke chapter 15. I'm just going to summarize it. Uh, you probably know it as the story of the prodigal son. But this story or this parable isn't just about one son. In fact, it was about two sons and a father. And in many ways, it was actually the father that is the focus of the story. But the story sort of goes like this. There was an older brother and a younger brother and a father. The father was a very wealthy man. And one day, the younger brother went to his father and it basically said to him, Dad, I wish you were dead. Because what he did was he asked for his inheritance, what he should have received after his father died. And he basically said, Dad, I want my cut of the estate. I don't care about you. I don't want a relationship with you. I don't want to live here anymore. I don't want anything to do with this. I just want my money, and I want to go. And the father honored his son's request. And so the young man took his wealth and his money, and he set out for what the Bible described as a far or distant land. And there the Bible says that he began to live the life that he thought that would please him. Right? He lived a life of indulging his flesh, of, of, of seeking to find fulfillment in the things of this earth. And so he lived a wild life. He partied, he drank, he lived a loose life with women. And so he, he lived a wild life, we might say. And there came a time, though, that he spent all that he had. And not only that, there was a famine. And so he was in dire straits. He's a foreigner. He's without money. And so he has to resort to taking care of pigs. And it's pretty funny, right, if you're a Jewish person, right, and your own dietary laws say that you cannot eat pig. No bacon, right? Are you thankful for grace, the new covenant? Amen? Yes. Right? All right. Every time you eat bacon, it's a celebration of the new covenant. All right? <laughs> You're like, that's terrible theology. All right, just enjoy the bacon, all right? But here he is, he's feeding the pigs, right? He's feeding the pigs. And one day, he, he, as he's thinking, you know, you get to do a lot of thinking when you're feeding the pigs. And he says, you know what? My dad, my dad has plenty of money. My dad has lots of resources. He says, I, I know that I burnt that bridge. I can't, I can't be his son anymore. That, that's over. But I'm going to go back and just ask if I can be one of his servants, because then I'll get to at least have a place to sleep and I'll have food to eat. And so he decides to go home. But as Jesus tells the story of this, this young man going home, he also tells the story of a father. And the Bible says, as Jesus tells the story, that, that the father was actually looking for the son. And I don't know, you know the other details of the story, but I sort of imagine that this was probably a daily occurrence. That the father went out to the hill and he looked out to see if maybe today my son was coming back. And it says that when he was still a long ways off, and he was already, you know how, you know how when you're in trouble and, and you sort of rehearse what you're going to say? How many of you ever like practiced what you were going to say to your parents? All right. Right? And you came up with something that's, or maybe you did it with your counselor this week, right? But you came up with something really good. 
right? And, and, and so he had rehearsed his story and how he was going to say it. Dad, I'm not worthy to be your son. Just let me, you know, he had, had it all down. But instead of having to go through that speech, it says the father ran to the son. And that's a, that way, if you were listening to the story in the first century, if you were hearing Jesus tell it, and I, I, I promise you he could tell it a lot better than I can. But if you heard Jesus tell this story, it, it would have shocked you because men in the first century, in this culture, they would not run in public. Right? They, they, that was undignified. And yet the father was running, and he ran to the son, and he didn't just greet him, but he wrapped his arms around him, and he embraced him, and he welcomed him. And then he said, you know what? He said to his servants, he said, go get, go get the best robe, right? go get sandals, and all these things were symbolic of, of the restoration. And then he said, go kill the fatted calf, the, the animal that we reserve for the best celebrations and the most honor when we want to honor our guest. And let's have a huge party because my son who was lost has come home. And so there was a huge party, but there was one person that wasn't at the party. And that was his brother. You see, his brother was not rebellious on the outside. His brother was someone who followed the rules, someone who was loyal. And he heard, he heard, he was out in the fields working and he heard, he heard the music getting cranked up and he could smell fatted calf. You know, he was like, are you with me, right? And, he, and so he asked one of the servants, he says, what's going on? What's all this music and, and I'm in the barbecue? And he said, your brother, your brother is home and your dad's throwing a party for him. But instead of rejoicing, his brother was angry. He was angry because his brother had squandered part of the inheritance and the rest of the inheritance would be whose? His. And so he's angry because his father is partying with his inheritance. Are you with me? Right? And he's receiving his son, and, and, and he's angry. And, and so the father actually comes out and talks to him and pleads with him. And he says, it's right that we're doing this. Your brother was lost, but now he's found. He was dead, but now he's alive. He's come home again. And why don't you come in and celebrate with us? And he starts to complain. He's like, Dad, you never even gave me a goat, right? That I could have a party with my friends. He's like, this isn't fair. And he could not, could not accept his father's acceptance of his brother. And Jesus told this story to illustrate the power of the gospel, right? That God welcomes and receives sinners. And he welcomes and receives us when we least deserve it and when we could not earn it. And when the father ran to the son and embraced him, he received him, he showed a picture of salvation. But unfortunately for the older brother, he was just as much in need of a savior. He just couldn't see it. Although his rebellion wasn't on the outside, you can see in the story that his heart was not with the father, right? Because his heart did not love what his father's heart loved. He didn't love his brother. And he refused to go in and he refused to celebrate. And so as we come to Galatians this morning, you know, Paul, as he's writing this letter, knew very well what it was like to be the older brother. Right? Paul knew what it was like to be the older brother because that's who he was. He was religious. He thought that it was about following the law, keeping the, doing the things. He knew the verses. He defended God. He defended God against these Jesus followers even who were illegitimate and a threat. And so Jesus, as Paul, Paul rather, he knew again what it was like to be the older brother. But Paul realized one day, obviously as Jesus intersected his life, his need for grace. And he was changed forever. And he became passionate about grace and about the gospel. And he was, he was, you know, as we've talked about, he was already a passionate person, but now he was fired up about the gospel. And this is what he said in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10. Then we'll get to Galatians. But in 1 Corinthians 15, 10, he said, But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Notice what he says. He says, it's not what I've earned. It's not what I've deserved, but it's the grace of God. By the grace of God, I am what I am. Grace has saved me and changed me. And you know, that's the picture. The younger brother, 
could not do anything. He had no capacity to do anything for himself. He had no excuses for his sin. He had no money. He had no hope. And yet the Father received him and lavished his love and his grace and his mercy, his warmth and his affection on him. And then that's the picture of salvation that God has offered to every single one of us. All of us are like the younger brother. We've all went astray, right? The prophet Isaiah said, would say, we've all gone our own way. And Paul was very clear that, that our own way is sin, and the wages of sin is death. And so the primacy and the power and the purpose of the gospel was, was something that Paul was so passionate about. Yesterday we left off you know, talking about our identity in Christ, right? who we are in Christ, that we've been clothed with Christ, that we belong to him, that we're his child. We talked about our, our community and our inheritance. And so as we pick up in, in, in chapter 4, verse 1, Paul's going to go on with this theme of our inheritance. He says, now that as long as the heir, now I say that as long as the heir is a child, he differs in no way from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. Instead, he is under guardians and stewards until the time that is set by his father. And so as he's thinking about our inheritance, he, he uses a cultural illustration of both the Jewish culture and the Roman culture that were present in this time, had a ceremony for, especially for boys but uh, girls as well, that when there was a time when they were recognized as becoming an adult. And for the Romans, this was a pretty significant thing because a Roman father uh, would not legally adopt or become his, his, his children's father until this time or this ceremony. And in fact, many times, a Roman father would not even pick his own biological kids to be his kids. Are you with me? All right? Uh, Maybe the most, most well-known example of this is a guy named Julius Caesar. Have you ever heard of him? All right. Julius Caesar, uh, when it came time to adopt an heir, uh, actually adopted his nephew, Octavian. Right? And you would probably know him as Caesar Augustus. You all are sharp. All right. Very good. And so notice, notice he says that... Uh, that he is under guardians and stewards until the time set by his father. Right? This was the Roman custom. Right? When, when the father thought the son was ready to be a man or ready to be his heir, it was then that he adopted him and made him a child of his. Or it could have even been um, someone else. But the point that Paul is, is making here, the point that he's driving at, is that sin causes slavery. That sin does not bring freedom. That sin doesn't offer us what we think it will. You know, a lot of times that when, when we face temptation, Satan is a very, very good liar. He's a master deceiver, right? And he, he is able to tell wonderful lies. Are you with me? And he is able to make what is not good look good. And he knows how to appeal to our desires, even our good desires, but he knows how to appeal to them in ways that will ultimately lead us away from God and in rebellion to God. I mean, think about all the way back to Adam and Eve, right? Are you with me? Right? He, he took that, which, you know, they, they only had one rule. Can you imagine that? Right? One rule. Right? Here, here's this wonderful world that I've made, this garden I've given you, and there's only one rule. Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because if you do, you will die. And, of course, Satan comes along and he says, don't you see how good this fruit is? Don't you see how beautiful it is? Don't you realize that God's holding out on you? Don't you understand how amazing it will be? And do you really think you're going to die? God's just being dramatic. He's just trying to hold out on you. He just wants to keep you from enjoying everything he's made. And ultimately, he wants to keep you from being like him. And Satan's lies work. And we know the tragic unfolding ever since. And Satan hasn't stopped lying. And he hasn't stopped deceiving. And listen, there's pleasure in sin for a season? Absolutely. Right? Solomon said this. He said, stolen bread tastes sweet, but afterwards it turns to gravel in your mouth. Have you ever had dirt in your mouth? All right? It's not a pleasant experience. If you haven't had dirt in your mouth and you don't believe me, you can try it later. All right? <laughs> I think you believe me, don't you? And so Paul would say sin makes us a slave, right? It, it, it imprisons us. But notice, notice verse 3. It says, in the same way, we also, when we were children, were in slavery under the elemental forces of the world. 
right? That, that, that things that our flesh desires, the things that our mind desires, our hearts desires, that by nature we seek things that are not good for us, that are contrary to God's ways. And whether it's a desire for power or success or wealth or pleasure or whatever it might be, Satan will tempt us to seek those things outside of the boundaries that God has established. Listen, God is not against enjoyment. Right, He created you with the ability to experience joy and beauty and pleasure. Right, These things are gifts from God. Right, That, that we have thousands of taste buds and so that we can enjoy good food. Right, We have so many things that God is, God is not against pleasure. He's not against enjoyment. In fact, our God is a joyful God. Right, He's filled with joy. But sin is the opposite of the goodness of God and the work of God and the pleasure of God. And sin, while it promises joy and it promises freedom, never brings what it offers. And so God offered us a solution. Look at verse 4. But when the completion of time came, or the fullness of time, or the right time, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. You know, God's timing is often very different than we would prefer or like or understand. Have you experienced that? How many of you like waiting? All right. Nah, not many of us. How many of you like things right away, right? All right. Yes. We live in a a world where we want things right away. We we want the package delivered right now. We we expect things. We click on it. We order it. We buy it. We live in an instant world. And and I, I don't like waiting. I never liked waiting. I'm not good at waiting. But God's timing is different. And, and, and that was clearly seen in his timing of bringing his son, the Messiah, the Savior, into the world. The people of God had waited and waited and longed and waited. And in, in the years preceding Jesus' coming, there had been no prophet for over 400 years that even spoke for God. Right? And that's, that's a long time. But God's timing is different than ours, and God's timing is good, and it's right, and it's perfect. And it says, when the right time came, God sent his son. And he was born into our world. The eternal Son of God became one of us. He became human. Right? John would say the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so he says he was born under a woman. He was born human, but he was fully God. He was born under the law. He he came to fulfill the law. And he came to redeem. That word means to buy out of slavery. to, To buy back what was originally yours. And so he came to redeem those under the law. Why? That we might receive adoption as sons. Right? That we might belong and that we might become his children. And listen, there are no accidental adoptions. Right? There are pregnancies that might be described as whoops, right? Or wasn't planning on that. Some of you might not have been planned by your parents, right? You were planned by God, however. You weren't a surprise to him. Right? But there are no accidental adoptions. You don't accidentally just adopt someone. It's an intentional choice. It's a willful choice. It's a choice born out of love. And God chose to adopt you and to bring you into his family and to call you his child. And for Paul, as he's writing this letter to these believers that are struggling with drifting away from the truth, drifting away from the gospel, right? Paul wanted to bring them back to the beauty and the power. He wanted, he says, Man, don't leave the gospel. Don't, don't, don't be tricked. Don't be deceived. Satan's the master liar. In this case, he was using false teachers. But he'll use all kinds of means and ways to try to draw us away, to doubt, to question. And listen, doubts and questions are okay, but don't allow those things to draw you away from the, from the love of God, from the grace of God, from what he's done for you. And Paul didn't want them. He wanted them to know their their relationship with Christ. Look at verse 6. He says, And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, an heir through God. He says, you've been brought through the gospel, through what Christ did, through His life, death, and resurrection, into a relationship where you're a child of God, and you can know God personally. Right? Abba was an Aramaic word for, for dad, for father, that was a term of endearment. It was a, a, a familiar term. And so he said, you can now be close to God. There's nothing that separates you from being close to God. Your sin has been paid for. Right? You've been brought into relationship. You can you know, approach God 
boldly. You can approach him confidently. You can approach him without fear. When you're, when you're, when you're struggling, when you're doubting, when you're hurting, when you're afraid, when you're lonely, you can go to your father, right? Because he will never reject you. Listen, my kids, they're both in the room right now. They, they, there's, they, I would never reject them if they came to me. No matter what they had done, no matter what they did, I would never reject them because they're mine, right? They're mine. And you belong to your Heavenly Father. He would never, ever reject you. He's never bothered by you. He's never embarrassed by you. He's never ashamed of you. In fact, Paul would say in one of his letters that he is not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. And Paul wanted them to know what they had, because if you know what you have, you won't drift away from it. Look at verse 8. He says, in the past, when you didn't know God, you were enslaved to things that by nature are not God's. He says, before you came to the Christ, before you came to the gospel, you were a slave of sin, right? And sin had power over you. It dominated you. It controlled you. It it was really, it affected your whole nature, your identity. But he says, now, since you know God, verse 9, or rather have become known by God, right, the supernatural aspect of salvation. Yes, it requires a faith response in us, but we wouldn't have that faith response if God didn't initiate the relationship, right? While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He comes to us, and he offers us his grace and his mercy. He says, how? How can you turn back again to the weak and bankrupt elemental forces? Do you want to be enslaved to them all over again? He says, do you really want to go back to that? Don't do that. He says, remember, you know, and I, you know, I had the privilege of coming to know Christ when I was a very young, young person at a vacation Bible school. You know, when, when I was 12 years old, I was baptized because I, I heard a message on baptism. I wanted to follow Jesus and be obedient to him. And I've told you some of my struggles. I did not always live out my faith very well throughout my middle school and early high school years. But I knew I belonged to God. And so sometimes it's hard because I feel like I've known God all my life. But I always have to remember who I am, and what I would be apart from Christ. And says, Paul says, don't forget that. All of us are familiar with the hymn Amazing Grace, written by John Newton. And many of you know his story. It's a powerful one. John Newton grew up in a home with a godly mom who loved him and prayed for him, but she died when he was seven years old. And John's father was not a godly man. He was a captain of a ship, and John spent most of his growing up years around ships and boats and sailors and men. He became a hardened young man. He became very, very evil and wicked. And at a very young age, he himself became a, a captain, and he was a captain of a slave trip. He was part of the slave trade. But one night in the midst of a, of a, of a violent storm that he was not sure he would survive, he called out to God, and God saved him. And you know, his mother, already in heaven, had prayed for him, <laughs> prayed that he would come to know Christ, prayed that he would live for Christ. And, and so John... John Newton became a follower of Jesus. He was saved and he was changed. He left the slave trade. He actually became a pastor, a hymn writer. And he never forgot what God did for him. He never lost sight of that. And it it was said that to keep his memory fresh, that he kept a copy of Deuteronomy, or a writing of Deuteronomy 15.15 in his office, or over his fireplace. And he would look at it every day. And it says this, you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. You see, it's good for us sometimes to remember who we were, to remember what God did. Because when we remember who we were and what God did, it reminds us now of who I am now, and that I don't want to go back to that. I don't want to go back to being a slave. I don't want to go back to where I was. The gospel is good news. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation for the Jew first and also for the Gentile. And listen, maybe, maybe you'd say, you know, I, I have a younger brother experience. Or maybe you'd say, I'm the younger brother right now in that parable that Jesus told. That I, I have sort of run away. And maybe not physically run away, but I, I've run away from God. Or I've run away from something. And, and you're wondering, well, would, would God take me back? And he absolutely will. And he absolutely would. He's waiting. He's waiting and watching and ready to embrace you and forgive you. There's no sin that you've committed that he won't forgive. And he's waiting to restore you. And I I love the picture. Man, when when the son came home, they had a huge party. 
right? They celebrated. There was loud music and there was good food and there was probably dancing, all right? Are you with me? Right? It, it was a celebration of, of the grace of God. But maybe you'd say, you know, maybe I'm more like the older brother. I've always tried to earn it. I, I've tried to be a good kid. I've tried to be a, a good person. I, I've tried to please my parents. I've tried to please my teachers. I, I'm trying to earn it. I'm striving. And you don't have to earn grace. You can't earn grace. And you can't earn God's acceptance. And you can't earn his love. He gives it freely. He offers it to every single one of us. Not through our performance, not through our goodness, but through his grace. So three things, three things that I want you to remember. Number one, remember what God has done. Seems simple, but the the realities of life, the experiences of life, the stuff that we go through, the hardship, the difficulty, the pain, the doubts, the uncertainty, anxiety, depression, loss, like we all go through a lot in life, and sometimes that can cloud our thinking. So remember what God has done for you. He loved you. He redeemed you. He paid the full price for you, right? So that he could not only redeem you out of slavery, but that he would adopt you as his own child and allow you to call him Abba, Father, allow you to know him now and for eternity. Remember, then number two, who you are. Remember that you're a child of God. And remember that that's not an insignificant thing. That's not a little thing. That's that's an extraordinary thing. Remember that you're an heir of his kingdom and his glory. And number three, remember whose you are. Remember that you belong to God. He bought you. He purchased you. He will not let you go. He will not abandon you. He will not fail you. So remember who you are. And as you do these things, I believe it will position you to live for him. Right, Because all of you have been saved, not just to go to heaven, but so that you could glorify God through worship and through living out your purpose. Every single one of you have a purpose. And that purpose is to know God, to love Him, to serve Him, and to live for Him. And I want to see all of you fulfill the purpose that God saved you for and created you for. Let's pray together. Father, I thank You for Your Word. I thank you that your word is living and powerful and true. And thank you that your word tells us about a Savior who loved us and gave himself for us. And Father, I know that there are many temptations sometimes to drift away from the good news. And whether it be going back to the law or whether it be being tempted to think that there, that there are other ways. Father, I pray that we would not drift away from the truth of the gospel. Father, I pray that the that the gospel would be something that, that we cling tightly to, that we would remember what you've done for us, that we, we remember who we are and whose we are. And Father, I pray that when, when doubts come, when attacks come, when questions come, that you would anchor these things firmly in our mind. Father, I thank you that you have rescued us from the slavery of sin. So Father, help us not to go back to those things, but to run to you and to your heart and to your purposes and to your grace. Father, we pray for strength for this day. Father, most of us are tired. Father, most of us are struggling a little bit in that area. So, Lord, we pray for strength and energy as we practice, as we rehearse, as we grow, as we learn. And, Father, I pray that that throughout this day we would experience your grace. Your power works best in our weakness, and so we trust that promise. And we ask for that grace today in Jesus' name. Amen.